Good afternoon. People are still coming in, so we'll give it a little more time before we really start. Um, my name is Nart Schreus. I'm from Eikdu, Norway. I will be the moderator in this session, which means I'll try to say le as least as possible because we will have the speakers to take most of the time. We were talking about design today, and Amy had got a short introduction in the opening of the EHIN. Um, and Birgitta was telling about that this room is not really designed for intimacy. So we will see, because if you stand up here, you're pretty close to all the people. There's a lot of light, so design is very important in a lot of, uh, lot of ways. And, and we were discussing also about how we designed the whole conference to, to get a good feeling and have the feeling that we can uh, mingle and talk to each other. So I hope really that uh, if you go around, you feel that we try to make it an open place to, for people to meet with different backgrounds. So I think even though there's still more people coming in, which is pretty good, we'll start with the session. And we'll start with uh, Amy Cueva. I hope that was right pronounced. And all those who were at the opening have seen her there. Uh, she's from Boston in the United States and working with uh, Design for Healthcare. And um, the idea that technology and people just not connect, we need to think about how we use the technology and how we use them into the processes. So Amy, I think uh, most people have been seeing you, so I will use a lot of time to introduce you. The floor is yours. Thank Up. you. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay, good. This time I have a presentation. Brought it on my laptop. Just one moment. Okay. Aha, it's there. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Amy Cueva, I'm one of the founders at MadPow. We are an experienced design agency based in Boston. Um, at MadPow, I also oversee our conference. Uh, we have a conference dedicated to the overlap of health and design. It's in the spring uh, each year in, in Boston. And I'm also the managing director of our Center for Health Experience Design. And in the center, we're uh, providing a resource, design and experiential innovation resource to health organizations worldwide. Um, and we're also a conduit for collaboration gathering together organizations across the ecosystem to uh, envision uh, better ways of delivering health to uh, the people we serve. And at MadPow, we're working with organizations across the health spectrum, payers, providers, government, nonprofit, health tech, and pharma. And in the process of working with such diverse organizations, we become aware of unmet needs, obstacles and opportunities, and uh, we're big believers in human-centered design, uh, empathy, and purpose-driven design. So I want to share a little bit with you today about how empathy-inspired and purpose-driven design can help us improve the quality of health experiences that we deliver to the people we serve. Uh, so just a little bit about MadPow. We begin with uh, empathizing with the people we serve, understanding their needs and goals, and then envisioning a better solution for them across the ecosystem of interaction. Uh, we dive deep into behavior change, uh, humanism, the belief that each person wants to be the best version of themselves, and if we align with their intrinsic motivation, we can help them get there. And then we also do organizational design to help organizations be more creative, innovative, collaborative. And then uh, we focus on digital execution as well. But in talking with many of you here today, uh, a worldwide trend is that we need a whole lot of change in health, as the robot so aptly put. Uh, the, the problem is that the world hates change, uh, but it's the only thing that's brought progress. And we know that change is difficult, but it's absolutely necessary. We see the enormous challenges that humanity faces from poverty to declining health, to environmental and economic distress. We don't just see it, we feel it. And we know there are so many problems to solve, but we also know there must be a better way. And in that 
knowledge, there is hope. Um, I believe that design gets us from where we are to where we want to be. It's um, an invitation to change and a method for bringing it about. And empathy is core to human-centered design. It gives us insight, and it can be the, the driving force in making the change we want to see happen. It elevates our consciousness, inspires our purpose, and helps us to imagine the possibilities. I have a question for you here. How many of you have been seriously affected by a health condition, either your own or one of a loved one? Right? Um, when coming to grips with the adversity I was facing in my own life, this wounded healer concept occurred to me. Uh, so I did a little bit of research, and I found that Carl Jung actually coined the term. He said, a good half of every treatment that probes it all deeply consists in the doctors examining himself. It is his own hurt that gives a measure of his power to heal. We know what it's like to experience pain, confusion, fear, and anxiety, and that enhances our empathy and our ability to serve the people that our organizations are built to serve. And that can create a burning desire within us to make change. And we need that drive, we need that desire, because people will tell us that we're wrong. You may have heard the saying, he who hears not the music thinks the dancer is mad. Anytime you're trying to fight the good fight, you may be met with resistance. But we need to get comfortable being uncomfortable because change is difficult, especially when you're the one driving it forward. We've seen change happening slowly over time, uh, but it's picking up pace, which is very exciting in health. We're seeing amazing things happen. Just in my story I shared this morning, uh, the research I had done with Jim three years ago, there was no solution. And then we participated in designing a solution that would help Jim. So things are happening. We're seeing a maturation take place in terms of how organizations understand and adopt human-centered design. It goes from hitting it with the pretty stick, making it look nice, to valuing user experience as, a, as an essential discipline and critical success factor. And then it moves all the way into putting people at the center and letting our empathy for them drive the focus of the organization and the decisions we make. And businesses and organizations are waking up to the, to the value of empathy to the point where it's being written about in the Harvard Business Review, where Belinda Palmer says, there's nothing soft about it. Empathy is a hard skill that should be required from the boardroom to the shop floor. So at this point, I'm not sure about in Europe, but in the US, uh, empathy has achieved buzzword status. Um, so get out your buzzword bingo cards and mark empathy. And this is great because it, it marks a huge step forward uh, in, the, in becoming more human-centric as a health system and as health organizations. But there's, there's dangers to buzzword status. It can lead to a cookie-cutter understanding of empathy, one that misses the target. Um, but empathy is not an end, it's a means. And it's not a trend, it's a philosophy. And if we embrace the core philosophy of empathy, it can truly guide our work. Uh, so let's talk about empathy. There's two types of empathy. One is cognitive empathy, uh, where we can understand the challenges people are facing and figure out what might be a better solution for them. So we're putting ourselves in their shoes, understanding and, and designing and building. Whereas emotional empathy is the, is the motivation, the desire to actually put your effort forth in improving the situation of another. And both uh, have a place in the work we do. Another thing that's kind of driving us forward are other trends that are happening. Uh, traditionally, feminine characteristics are now being embraced by everyone, which is great because they were probably there already. But the whole, you know, there's no emotion in business, uh, it's not true anymore. Uh, we know that emotion provides a different level of insight. Many good people have made many bad decisions when operating in a strictly cognitive context, we know that emotion pr provides a different level of insight that we can use. Uh, nurturing, collaborating, understanding, these are being embraced in the business world, which is fantastic. Also, millennials, uh, the selfie generation, are actually, <laughs> they get a bad rap, but they're actually wanting to make a difference and make an impact. And then there's also the movement of conscious capitalism, which is to look beyond 
short-term returns and take the long view, as well as uh, social innovation. So we're moving from designing for utility, productivity, convenience, into designing for meaning and value in the context of people's lives with the goal, the purpose of human flourishing. Now that sounds like a lofty goal, um, and it is, but all of the decisions we make large and small, when they stack up, and when they're done within the context of purpose, uh, they'll make an impact and will create a sea change. Uh, Cindy Gallup actually puts it well when she says shared values plus shared action equals shared profit, both financial and social. And a few people on stage today mentioned values. Uh, I think that's wonderful because it really can guide the work we're doing. And this one project we did for uh, Center for Disease Control is focused on medication adherence in HIV. And we took a collaborative approach uh, to this project, working with local sa aid services organizations, uh, JSI, and the government, uh, to design an app for adherence that goes beyond nagging. And we really wanted to understand what's driving non-adherence. And in this case, it was uh, medication had extremely bad side effects, made people feel terrible, and they didn't even know if it was working. And so in this application, we're tying improved adherence to lab results so that uh, the person can see the connection. We also created a, a buddy system for social support uh, so that if someone isn't engaged, they have a community around them to uh, support them and bring them back. And this approach is important because the patient Right now, uh, the person is left at the center of a very disconnected ecosystem. It's more connected here, which is great. Uh, but the system doesn't come as close to whole health as we would hope possible, considering our human ability to care, to connect, and to innovate. The experiences we deliver are a byproduct of how we're organized to deliver. If we are a mess of silos inside and outside of our organization, then the resulting experience is going to be a mess as well. And that's why I believe that collaboration is the new innovation. Uh, I mentioned that this morning. In partnering with each other, we can amplify our opportunity to make an impact and be effective. So enough with philosophy. Um, here are some ideas on how you can integrate empathy and purpose into your work. First, asking the question, what impact are we hoping to make? How will we measure it? How is it going to pay off for us and the people we serve? And again, in taking the long view, uh, we need to help people manage their chronic conditions, but what can we do to prevent them from becoming patients to begin with? And this is important, especially as the incidence of chronic condition is on the rise, and then we can take the defined purpose and translate it into guiding design principles. Uh, what kind of organization do we wish to be? How do we manifest that experience? What are our guiding values? And we can translate those into decision-making structures that can kind of guide our efforts. Clayton Christensen says that you have to have a good theory Every time we take an action, it's predicated upon a theory. It's an understanding the people we serve in the present that we can construct a theory about the future. So this is about getting outside of the four walls of our organization and getting face time with the people we serve. In developing an understanding of what's going on with them, uh, what's going to drive real meaning and value in the context of their lives? What will truly motivate, engage, comfort, and guide? And we can immerse key stakeholders in the process. We can bring them along with us so they can experience firsthand what the people out there are experiencing. We took this approach in uh, developing a support tool for nurses uh, in the operating room. Uh, we looked to understand the entire ecosystem and what's going on so that we weren't just going to throw an iPad in the ER, but really understand what was needed. And it transformed the way that this organization, this uh, surgical device company, uh, was going to provide support. One other crucial thing is to invite others to the table. 
to imagine the possibilities. Now this is stakeholders across the organization, uh, legal, regulatory, technology, research, business, because when they understand the needs of the people we're serving and they design with us, they'll be more likely to push hard and make it see the light of day. A key method uh, in human-centered design is called participatory design. So we invite people to the table of innovation and they're designing with us. We're ideating, we're coming up with new ideas with them. So it's a making activity, but it's also a research activity because in seeing how, what people create, you come to understand their perspective, what's important to them, and what's needed. We took this approach uh, with Joslin Diabetes Center in uh, Boston. They have uh, renowned clinical expertise for diabetes care, but they wanted to extend that expertise and provide a digital tool uh, that would help diabetics lose weight. So we were taking a three-month classroom-based program and putting it online for more people to use it. And so we approached the design process involving patients, involving coaches, and having them design with us. And we came up with the social support, the videos around nutrition and fitness, uh, and designed for failure. Uh, what happens when someone falls off? How do we guide them back on to their path and keep them motivated? Also, uh, to evangelize the benefits of human-centered design across the organization, to train, to teach, but again, to immerse and invite. And to pay attention to emotion, our emotion and the emotion of the people we're serving. Uh, call center observation can be very valuable uh, in this way. When someone calls uh, or sends an email in the heat of the moment, you're going to get the real story, not like you're going to get in a survey three months later or talking to them in an interview. Uh, also, ethnography, observation, watching people in their native habitat at home or in the clinical environment, going into the waiting room, uh, being a secret shopper, uh, putting yourselves in the shoes of somebody to the point where you actually try to complete their activities. Uh, this can help us understand really what's going on. We took that approach in creating a decision support tool for maternity care that was designed to reduce anxiety and increase confidence. So as women are told, you have a large baby, it's like, okay, what does that mean? What decisions might, might I have to make and what aligns with um, my values and what's important to me. Another key tenet is to design for people at their worst. When we're designing, we tend to think about the happy path and the bright new way and, you know, technology is going to give us all the answers. But what happens when something goes wrong? Because inevitably it will. We're humans and our systems are human and there will be flaws. How do we bring people back into the fold? How do we consider the full range of emotions that we're designing for and design for people when they're at their most vulnerable moments. Uh, this is a core philosophy of universal design. In fact, that when we design for the edge cases, which can often get scoped out, uh, we will actually make things better for everybody. And we've seen this actually when technology has been purposed for those with um, uh, sight uh, or hearing or uh, cognitive issues that technology actually has been now used for the masses. We can uh, formulate a research-inspired hierarchy of needs. This is an adapted Maslow's hierarchy. Um, we can have a tendency in the industry to have shiny object syndrome, uh, focus on the tool, the technology, that that will give us all the answers and solve all the problems, and it's very, very cool. But first, uh, we need to focus on how do we make sure the experience is trustworthy, safe, kind, easy, and it's providing meaning and value. And then I have the very cool up there just so that everybody can feel safe. It's still there. We're still going to be cool, but we're going to deliver the other stuff first. And this can be adapted for your own organization and uh, put to use. We focused on this uh, when we were helping a, a hospital uh, in the States empower the newly diagnosed, understanding that they were going to go home and have to change what they were eating their activity levels, and either their family was going to be with them or not. Um, so how would we pull the family into the picture so that the family could support 
the person uh, and help them along their journey as well. And we also want to figure out how do we make the connection between what's going on digitally and what is happening person to person with the doctor. For example, if a diabetic patient was told, you need to lose 15 pounds, and then they come in all excited to the doctor appointment, I lost 15 pounds, and then the doctor doesn't even notice. How do we raise this uh, to the attention of the doctor and even pro uh, provide them with a certificate when they show up, right? So how do we connect the digital with the human experiences? Because inevitably, the technology that we design should empower and enable better human relationships instead of distracting from them, make them even better. So. One way uh, to kind of pull this all together is to look at the ecosystem, take the person and trace their pathway through their journey. What are all the other organizations they're interacting with? What are all the actions that they're taking? What are their obstacles? What are their challenges? What do they really want? I think sometimes we expect patients to serve the system and be obedient and do what they're told, but what do they truly want and how do we help them do that. But we can look for orphan needs, things that fall into a canyon between two organizations or services, and look to who can we collaborate with? How, do, how can we extend our services? How can we possibly meet this need? And start to reach out and deliver the information that people need when they need it, as opposed to waiting for them to come and get it. Uh, we can also uh, stimulate and align with intrinsic motivation to facilitate lasting behavior change. So we love penalties and rewards, but they don't work long term. They can stimulate initial change, but uh, in truly understanding what motivates people, uh, if we align with that, we'll be more successful. This is a game we designed uh, to get people up out of their seats throughout the day and reduce sedentary behavior in the workplace. Uh, it's a real life game uh, and there are different activities. You can pick stair climbing, dancing, whatever you want to do and challenge your coworkers. And if they're in a meeting and they can't climb flights of stairs, you get points, they lose points. Uh, you can uh, trash talk them. But uh, we piloted this with the American Heart Association and 66% of people got up out of their seat more and it was like a gateway drug where it started with uh, squats and then it moved into uh, getting a gym membership or going for a walk at lunch and things like that. Uh, we can look at every touch point in the ecosystem, email, text, in-person, website, before the visit, during the visit, after the visit, preventatively, condition management, look at every touch point and decide what are our levers and triggers, what can we actually do to make change. And um, we did this with CVS, uh, they were looking to improve their digital experience, but we learned that some people are showing up at CVS on the worst day of their lives. They were diagnosed with a life-altering condition. How could they go above and beyond to be there for people when they needed them most? Uh, because in, in the system, there was nobody there for them on that day at that time after their short visit with their doctor. Also, to evaluate and measure. We have our purpose, the impact we're going to make. How do we evaluate that and measure that uh, and make sure that we're tracking toward our goals. Uh, empathy can be measured and other soft metrics uh, can be measured like trust, uh, even forgiveness. Are people likely to forgive your organization after something goes wrong? Um, there's also you know, net promoter score and things like that, but we can start to tie the soft measures to the uh, harder measures as well. And finally, uh, how do we uh, guide business decisions? Will this have a positive impact on the people we serve, neutral or negative? And if it's going to have a negative impact, what is the escalation pathway for um, avoiding that and making better decisions? So again, moving beyond design thinking into design doing, we can do it because we are the design. We spend a lot of time talking about technologies and nodes and networks and connections and APIs and platforms and all of that is extremely important because it's going to get the right information to the right person at the right time and enable people to communicate. But how we interact with each other creates a design. And that's why get-togethers like this are so important because we can collaborate, share ideas, and build new relationships. So that's all. Thank you.
very much. It's not working. <laughs> try to get some sound on it. Try again. Yeah, put it on. Hello? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank Amy. Thank you. All right. This was very good. Those who still haven't had enough of Amy, <laughs> she'll be part of the debate, the sofa debate, where between half past five and half past six in the center of the of the exhibition area. It's on the future of healthcare. I'm looking forward and to it. And it will be very high level, very good, very interesting guests. And you will be one of them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, we continue. Yes. Moving to Norway, Birgitta Kapellen is going to... Looking for the slides. Yeah, the slides surely come. She works at the Institute of Design at the Oslo School for Architecture and Design and is working with several projects, uh, which is called RIME, or is that? Um, that's a resource council uh, financed project, which are about the um, Generation social, mobile, and multimedia health promoting technologies. Wow, that sounds yeah. very, very ambitious. Okay, the floor is yours. And I hope uh, sound works. No, now is it okay? Yeah, I'm a little bit. Uh, you know, it. I need glasses because I'm no s just so old now, so I need that. I'm a little confused to looking there, not there, and I hope it will go well. My point is, I have, it's for me. It's interesting to be in this environment again because I've I've been working very many years for industry, and now I've been in academia for a lot of or uh, a lot of years, and suddenly it's a very diff different arena. But um, I'm going to talk about what I will suggest to be a new paradigm in health technology. What I will call vit uh, I've chosen to call vitalizing welfare technology, and of course, uh, say a little bit overview. I need take those out. A little bit background, uh, a little bit about welfare technology from a theoretical point of view, the health approaches, what I th think about vitalizing welfare technology, this new paradigm. I will back, uh, ground that in the RIME project, which is a project uh, we financed from the R Research Council of Norway when we are exhibiting parts of it here. And it's actually extremely, maybe, word leading uh, <laughs> ambitious in the area of in in, uh, Internet of Things. So, uh, um, and the, uh, I'll talk about the RIME project, about the gold approaches, uh, the value of computers and culture aspects, not only design, I'm not a designer myself, but looking at culture, both art and music into this, and don't talk about design for, their, uh, for universal design, or un uh, but I've talked about design for diversity, which is another approach, uh, and a critical approach to in inclusive design and, and, and universal design. Um, um, so the potentiality of computers regarding music and mu multisensorial experiences. We have done a lot of tangibles, which we have chosen to call it for a long time because of the discussion of what we were doing, since we were working on an approach that was uh, m uh, um, Coming from different fields, we we started talking about tangibles, but someone called it furniture, someone called it artwork, uh, someone called it instruments. So we had, had this discussion going all, all the time. Now I'm suggesting it's utilizing welfare technology. So we get, went from music instrument over to something called multisensorial environment, and now to uh, utilizing welfare technology. And we have started working with children, but we s now we started working in di dementia care. Little bit about my background, not too much about it, but I've been working with in interface design my whole life, since I'm 85, you know. So I've been doing a lot of screen-based design for all kinds of industry, and I was in industry for a long time, but since uh, 1998 I've been working in with tangible interaction, what we now call the Internet of Things. And I'm an associate professor at School of Architecture and Design, which actually has one leading design in service design, and we work a lot with health, uh, health um, um, pr projects. So just to mention that if you don't know about our school and what we do in service design and health, health uh, services design. Um, I, I've been re responsible for this, the design development of the RIME prototypes because that, that have been collaborative design. Time. So I've just been <laughs> responsible for putting it out. I've been working with two musicians 
So, and that's the more important thing here is actually we are all coming from a humanistic field. I have some background in the computer science from the University of Oslo, but, but mainly we come from a humanistic point of view into this field. We worked together for a long time. But I'm actually now, since this is so futuristic work, I'm actually working with the making the sense, uh, the prototype myself. It's so handmade soldering, hands wise sewing, and so on. A little bit about health approaches. Does it work? No? It stopped working? Okay. okay. Uh, health approaches. Um, the main health approach that we traditionally think about is the biomedical health approach, where we measure medical parameters. And we follow up um, um, medical uh, um, parameters. Public health is about reducing this kind of risk, working in the paradigm of pathology, diseases diagnosis. Then there are the so well, so humanistic or social health approach, which we are working from. It's based on people's experience of health, their own experience of health, not the, the doctor's measuring of their health, and focus on their abilities and resources, not their weaknesses, N and diagnosis. And the interesting thing, if you look at the welfare technology, more mainly they are focused on the biomedical aspect, and that's what I want to focus on here today. That working from another point of view, from the health promoting, the social health promoting point of view, is another way of working. And if you look at the, the Danish definition, which is very, very important in the definition of welfare technology, they mainly focus on the service. Welfare technology, the welfare technology is about the service. But in the Norwegian definitions, they are actually also focusing on life quality and cultural activities and uh, participation and being part of the, 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 the society. And this is a very important thing. When you come to Sweden, they don't talk about uh, welfare technology at all. And in other parts, like uh, they talk about health promoting technology or health improving technology. That's the, the British and the U, uh, U, uh, uh, American uh, words in, in this, this field in our, of academia. And, and if you see in Norway, we talk about welfare technology all the time. So what has been the development of welfare technology? There's a lot of money going into this field, and of course a lot of business opportunities, as we see here. But the strange thing is it's all about this measuring. It's alarms, and it's uh, measuring, and so on. Even the chosen platform, when they talk about the wellness technology, they talk about blood, blood pressure, pressure uh, measuring, pedometer, VEX scale, fitness equipment, um, uh, and medi uh, medication tracking. All these are about coming from this field. Where are the other health-promoting approach in this field at all? And they talk about wellness technology. So if you look at the, the uh, um, health promotion charter from 86, long time ago, they talk about health as a resource for life. And the health sector, 86, must move increasingly into a health promoting direction. And if you look out here, where are we? We have to embrace people's own resources, their own definition of their own life. Uh, I've been working for many years with people in wheel wheelchairs, and you know, I try to be so nice and help them and roll. And then after two years, he said to me, You know, the worst thing you could do with me is pull me. Because it would be like pulling someone, and you would never do that with someone not sitting in a wheelchair. And I was really, really embarrassed because I did, because it, they consider it natural when they've been in the wheelchair for some years, that perspective on the world. Even if you look at the project that we have been involved with, these uh, welfare technology in Centre, it's about uh, uh, blood sugar measurement, uh, blood pressure measurement, temperature measurement, weight, and so on, and alarms a lot. And this is what we are doing. But does this really increase health and well-being and the quality of life? I'm just questioning it. Of course we need it, but don't we need something else? 70-80% of use of these alarms, to the gas alarm, are misused. Why? For medical use, they are misused. We can't, we can't have medical people answering this when it's actually loneliness. This is very popular, but it, does it look like something that's going to promote 
promote life quality, this thing? It looks like a medical device. Now I'm the doctor also. Is this actually a good health promoting experience? If you see what they've done with it, they knitted something around it so it didn't look like this. Measure and control, is it good? Or are we, are we actually going to stress ourselves to death? Maybe that is the reason why we are dying from ca cancer. The main reason for dying is stress. And will this actually make this better? If we are dying from stress, that we are going to measure more? Some of my colleagues have longed of these measuring things. We all have it. But there lies potentiality here, and that is a cross-mediation. Now we have been looking a lot at screens and screens, and we talk about multimedia, here's a picture, here's a text, and here's a picture, and here's a text. It's quite old-fashioned, really, even if it's on an iPad or a smartphone. But the interesting thing is the cross-media thing, because we live in a body, a physical body, and sometimes we think we live inside here. We actually have a, a feeling of being a body, and it's a really main experience. We seem to forget it, but we are walking around, even if we are looking like this all the time. And the cross-media expectation potentiality here is very interesting. And of course, you know, when you have a smart telephone here, you can't have everything here, so then you have to go over there and then go over there. And theater knows a lot about this. You hear a sound, you turn around, and then something happens. The culture people knows about that. The computer design people, a picture, text, the same thing. Reference it from the same. Film, it's not about that. It's about you hear a sound and you see another picture and in your head you create a relation. The Rhyme Project. We've been working from 2011 to 2016. The partners, uh, School of Architecture and Design, University, in, uh, University of Oslo, in, uh, in Institute of Informatics, and the Center for Music and Health at the Norwegian Academy of Music. And we are financed by the Research Council in, in, in Norway. Our original goal was to create interactive musical and multimedia tangibles. We got mobile money, social media money. Everyone thought we were going to do something with Facebook and Internet of Things. And we tried to join them together to improve health and well-being for children with special needs and their families. Our health categories, humanistic social health approach, reduce passivity and isolation. And if you look at diagnosis, how important it is just to move, just to the, the metaphor of the mus muscle, use your brain, use your body, think new thoughts, you know, get something doing, reduce isolation and passivity. It's good for everything, really. You don't have to go into all these diagnoses. Evoke vitality and self-expression. Strengthen resources and action, be part of a community, create relations, participation, meaning, and create mastery. The value of music and sensorial experiences. Remember, we have years of art. Can offer important social and cultural and emotional experiences. And it is a right to be part of cultural activities. The health effect of music is now well documented for 15 years. And now we are also coming research in the area of multisensory ter therapy, which has been a therapy field for a long time, but not very much research has been going on there. But in the music field, they have been very clever. We know now many, many ways that music and sensory stimulation can improve vitality, empowerment and health. This is an important uh, book in the, in the, or a concept in the uh, area, and you can use it as a metaphor, very important. They take the, instead of talking about music as an artwork, as a piece of music, they're talking about musicking as a verb. And it's the expectation, it's about listening, but it's also about playing the violin or the cello. So this is an in interesting co concept. So, and again, now comes the computer technology, which is my, I'm coming from that field, and used my whole my life, I was on internet in 84, you know, used my whole life on this net. Uh, and little, 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 little interactive uh, technology have been used for health improvement re related to music therapy, for instance, before we started this project. Um, and there are great potentialities, and the 
shocking thing when I come into this field is that it's all about the sensor, the push button. We are back to the push button. They call about the switches. And the fantastic thing with computers is not that it is a switch. The interesting thing is the software, the intelligent software, that it can listen, it can wait, it can remember, it can recognize, it can shift cross media. Something happening there and something here. Not that you do have a switch. And it can respond, it can build tension, expectation, and we can work from a musical and narrative expectations instead of just, oh, stimuli, response, stimuli, response. It's actually quite old fashioned. So, this resource and empowerment orientation focuses on people's strengths, not their weaknesses. We have to offer positive experiences where there are no wrongs and failing. My first computer course was about checking input because the user might do something wrong. There should be no errors. Uh, error messages is not necessary, it's bad design. In many ways for the vitality and self-expression, many ways to act and build competences, many ways for mutual social relations, and many ways to share and participate. We have uh, I can't show all this, but we have sh done four generations of multisensorial environment, what I now suggest to call it vitalizing welfare technology, and a lot of student work, and we are really good students. So we've done these kind of things in between furnitures, environments, cross media, using sound and music, visual and tangible, but also screen-based uh, interfaces in combination with each other. To to, to make more, uh, reduce isolation and passivity. Yeah, I just show you this thing. I think you get the cushion, soft textile, uh, lots of computers inside. Why does it have to look like this? And so on. And, and remember, we are still handmade all these things. 2011 interactive chair, make, you might call it, call it a sculpture. We have done a lot of user testing also on these things. Here are some students' work, some combination of things, embedding light, embedding physical appearance. And remember this thing that we are a body, or that we don't these hard things. You don't, you know, when I came to this area, they put this hard bottom in the back. And you know, I think it's not empathic. It's really not very nice to do it. This big butt with these plastics. No. We are better than this. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Like, uh, no, sorry. Yeah. So you see, get the point. We've done a lot. This is student work. A uh, lot of different experiences, just working with the bedding down, creating something that is not only flushy design, but really is meaningful on an art level. So this was, uh, we did courses with the art school also. Yeah, different kind of uh, experiences. And all these things we are tested also on. The third, uh, fourth generation, just went far, uh, far, fast through it, is Polly. We, we are showing someone at the, the stand of uh, Forskningsrådet, um, the Research Council of Norway, over here. Polly, it is a word. Polly, polygon, poly, polymorph, many, many. Fun way of saying many. Uh, it has one in wired interactive thing po we call Polyland and three wireless, Polyplanet, Polyocean and Polyfire. Two are over there. And then now if we're talking Internet of Things, we have two apps which we can communicate, both controlling and composing. So you can comp compose on the uh, iPad and uh, communicate with the things. And very important thing is uh, self-regulation, that you have the ability to control your own life. So it has been very important that you can put on your own music of your desire. You don't want that whale music of the whole institution. People get quite frustrated. Fr 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 by it, they want to have their own music. And when you start working with dementia, it's really important in order to work with recalling memories. So this is very important. How could we do that? We used RFID technology, very, in very interesting. So that's why tag thing. We brought in a lot of cultural objects so they could relate to and they could remember, and we put on an additional interactive layer based on, on, on what was accessed by through RFID. So here is Polyland, the end. Uh, why it's so big is actually because we wanted to be work with a screen as an interactive, as a soft, so, so this background projection, that's why the size of it, you see here, yeah, the, the size of it, because we wanted to use handheld camera, uh, Pico projectors, uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of sensors, 
screen, speaker, inductive charging, camera, microphone, bend sensor, put, put touch sensor, RFID readers, and so on. A lot of sensor, very, that you can roll over with a wheelchair. I don't do that with my computer, so it has to be very <laughs> robust. And using RFID te technology has been amazing for putting up your favorite music here, Sh choosing bad with um, yeah, uh, Jackson. And uh, very important to show your own music, and you can choose my own music, that you are feeling empowered by listening to your music. And we also tried with a lot of soundscapes, factory sound, woods, land, and so on. What's really interesting when we were start working, working with the people with dementia, because they remember things, oh, that's, and they started talking about the, the, the sound of the, of the, 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 the birds and so on. But they haven't come up with that idea. That came from the music therapist uh, professor idea, was actually idea. So we worked very collaborative all together. We used a lot of things. We have uh, worked a lot with the uh, um, children with the, the, um, autism, and they became very cocooning in their own lives. So in order to make interest, we intro introduced a lot of artifacts which they could relate to. And they could put on their own things that they want into the landscape, into the polyland, with additional, in order to make this kind of interaction with our Friday, an additional sound. And this is all artificial intelligence based in the musicology page. The, way the guy, guy that's ma ma making the programming, the, the sounds, is, is educated, a, a musician, he's not an engineer, so he composes music as art uh, in uh, his uh, ordinary life. Um, next, yeah. We put together different kinds of shapes. This is not just look at the shape. It's actually the way of thinking that is interesting. It's actually just a lot of polygons that makes a shape. And it's a, a banana cushion which they are using in therapy a lot because it's actually a body. And you can have it around you and so that. And a ball is a also a problem. And this is actually a kind of plaid and a cushion together. So the, the, the important thing is that the, the, the knowledge and the platform that we have developed through the project. So it's now we have a standard platform. Inside, the same technology inside, based on something called Beaglebone Black. Uh, and, uh, and this is Wi-Fi based. So it's extremely, we, we tried Bluetooth, it couldn't work with, because it's not far, far and so on. And we have a control app where I, in this example, I control the, the, the planet, the, the big ball. And what I can do, I can use my iPad, I can choose the same kind of uh, music. And then I can say, yeah, I want to create music on, and then I can use just the graphical user interface to create the, the, the composition or, here comes a very important thing where learning and health comes together. I extremely long mastering curves. Infinite mastering curve. Uh, that is the key to health. I feel I can. I feel I can. I feel I can. I feel it's fun. I feel it's fun. And then it can't be a toy that is very boring after a very short time. It has to have intelligence and challenges or it's long side. So we actually built a music high level uh, la language, music language on top of Twitter, social media. So you can write your composition in text uh, in, and send it over. Here I send the composition over to the ball. ball. So think at the scenario. You are lying, the, your mother is a di had dementia, she's lying in bed. You send a little composition to her in the morning. Physical experiences. You can create your own, on your own time tar terms, remember musicking. I can be passive, I can be active. It's all musicking. We can collaborate, we can have the worst way to handle if you are short, if you are strong, if you can't do. And you know, I've seen all blind people, feel wheelchair, not movable, every. So there are diverse ways to act in the multisensorial landscape. We have now been traveling around with this thing to the very interesting cultural. A uh, rucksack program, yeah, uh, and and seen different kinds. And suddenly, the engineering money became culture again. I think it's very interesting. As a researcher, I'm not obligated to do this, but it gave me fantastic experience because I've been researching with five families for five years. Suddenly, I could meet a lot of different kind of children and experiences. Working with blind, which I had that and, do, and so on. So we came up with a lot of qualities that things sh should be. Um, and 
w th this is my vision for, for the vitalizing Wilper technology. With this challenge we are assisting, uh, are f approaching here in Norway, and, uh, and the other thing, the assistant have been living, living longer at home, uh, reducing hospital costs, increasing quality of life, the challenge with universal design, thinking from above, pretending to be God design, social media potentiality, what I suggest is a new invented word, yes, but a new focus on ambition for welfare technology, new ways of designing health improving technology, a new way of designing technology based on a humanistic health approach, resource oriented, designing for diversity, uh, not universal and inclusive design, compassion, not empathy, going one word further. It, it is far, it's an interesting word, going from um, empathy, because that is actually t t taking up the own uh, feelings into yourself. So the research going on in compassion, this is what I suggest is going to be the new way of thinking from the uh, design point of view, designing with compassion instead of uh, uh, empathy. Connecting technological, culture and health knowledges competency together, and we have to connect them. Like in the VIS project, the interviews were done by only by designers. Yes, I am a designer, but I am not a health professional. And when the health professional and I see the same, we see different things. And we have to work collaborative. I have a lot of other work which I can't show, so I just say thank you because, um, yeah, thank you. Microphone, yeah. Very nice, thank you. I think you get a little gift from us here. Oh, yeah, no, 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 you can put it for here, you okay, can take talk. it. Okay, that's great. There's a lot of uh, very concrete examples how we can work with design in healthcare, and it's pretty nice. Our next speaker is uh, working with a uh, new company, Emily MD, and Jens M. Gledic. And you need a <laughs> pointer. The technology should be in the right place. And you're working to make healthcare simpler and smarter through design and intelligent technology. Well, I think everybody wants to make healthcare simpler <laughs> and smarter. So we're going to listen to you. How do you do that? Sure, thank you. I'll get that more specific. Uh, as uh, introduced, my name is Jens Gledic. I'm a doctor and I'm also educated in design and uh, interaction uh, or informatics. Uh, and uh, I'm currently, uh, last year I've been engaged in, uh, in a project that uh, concerns uh, utilizing artificial intelligence and, and, um, and design together uh, to, to make the communication between patients and doctors better in the primary care um, sector. Uh, d this uh, very simple illustration shows the relationship between uh, between actors, the patient, uh, the doctor, and, and an artificial intelligence agent. Uh, and, and, and my point here is that uh, artificial intelligence uh, is not a new concept in healthcare. There has been for many, many years, uh, mycin is an example of a, a system that was introduced in the 80s that helped doctors uh, find the, the correct antibiotics for patients. Uh, and the way these systems work is that uh, the doctor uh, consults with the patient and then consults with the system. Uh, so uh, in, in the degree that uh, artificial intelligence has been employed in healthcare, it has to a very large extent been uh, to upfront for doctors and not for patients. Patients has not interacted directly with artificial agents uh, in a very big way. But that is changing uh, greatly. Uh, and there's a lot of actors that see uh, a great potential in this. Uh, I think the b you could say the one of the greatest uh, movers or the, the greatest uh, uh, pulls uh, for, for, for this change is what some actors call the pre-primary care uh, phenomena. Uh, to, to explain this, I could uh, demonstrate sort of a very s simple uh, schema of the, the levels of care that we uh, talk about or traditionally talk about in our society. You have the patient here as the same and you have the primary care and in the level behind that you have the specialty care. Uh, now, 
it's, it's sort of in the word uh, of primary care that this is the first level of, of care. This is the, the first place you get care. But, of course, that's not really the case. Uh, to a large extent, this is the first level of care, at least for the last 10, 20 years. The first thing patients do uh, when they have a problem is not to seek uh, um, medical professionals to ask uh, what they, they can do for them, but to uh, consider what they can do for themselves. Uh, and so, well, I don't think there is a consensus on what you call this segment. It's been sort of a bastard for, uh, for, for a long time, but some actors uh, call it the pre-primary care segment. Uh, and, well, as I said, it's been a bastard. Uh, the, 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 the tools the patient have at his or her disposal in this phase uh, are Google, obviously, uh, foras on the internet, where you could discuss everything from diets or health tips, uh, or like symptom checkers. And, and the patients have, at their own will or at their own whim, um, could consult these technologies and often bring these uh, results to the doctor at the phase where they consult the doctor. And, uh, well, it's a good thing that they care about their own health, but uh, they're also uh, a result of that is also that you need to make a lot of time to, uh, to correct false assumptions uh, and to, uh, well, it, it's, it's obvious as a doctor sitting in this position and getting these kind of patients in uh, that a lot of the information the patients consult are not validated. Um, and, and, I mean, Technologically, you could say that maybe the symptom checker has been the most advanced tool uh, for a long time in this segment, but even that uh, is really not always helpful, I would say, almost to the contrary. Uh, so the interest in, in the primary care uh, segment uh, is not based on the status that it is today, but uh, rather what it could be if, if the agent or the tools that the patient had at their disposal in this phase were more intelligent. Um, we could talk a bit about this. If the tools that the patient consulted in the first phase uh, had any sort of smarts or intelligence, they could help un the patient understand the problem better, they could give the patient better advice, immediate advice, uh, they could help the patient follow up uh, on problems and symptoms in expectation of uh, a consultation. They could prepare the patient towards or for the doctor. A doctor could g be given a sort of a transcript of, of the patient's problem uh, even before the patient arrives. So the, pa so the doctor can know or get a ballpark feeling of, of what kind of problem they're facing with this patient and, and what kind of preparations the doctor can do. Also, as a form of decision support. The smart system here would be able to say that this patient has uh, reported this kind of problem and we know for a fact or we know from experience that of the patients that report with these kind of problems or similar so problems, these are very relevant uh, examinations or, or questions or tasks to, to take the consultation further at the doctor's end. Uh, also, it's, it's a very... Um, potent tool in, uh, in finding the right level of care for the patient. Uh, you have uh, a, an increasing number of, of uh, care modalities, so to speak. Uh, everything from, from uh, a full consultation examination to video consultations and e-consultations where you almost just text or send an image to your doctor. And, and a sort of a triage session here could, could also be done in this phase where you could, uh, could, could uh, direct the patient to the right level and to the right uh, caretaker. Of course, there's uh, also the obvious um, possibility that you could, uh, uh, you could give the patient a guess of diagnosis. There are a number of actors in this space that, that choose to do this. Uh, myself personally, and that may be because, also in part because I'm a doctor, I think that is not a very good idea. I think that makes a lot more uh, harm than good at this point. I think it's a better approach to this problem 
seeing it is a, a very sensitive thing. It's a very, uh, very important and, and well dangerous thing to get a wrong diagnosis. So you should rather be uh, safe or err on the side of error here than to take unnecessary risks. More like uh, self-driving cars in my eyes. That it's it's not enough to just be better than average drivers. If if a car is better than an average driver uh, that's driving itself, still, if the car crashes, you get headlines all over the world. So so uh, it's better to be like really safe and say that we're not putting any diagnosis at all until we know that we can do that with do it with a confidence that ten times as high as a as a human. Well, maybe exaggerating, but that's the idea I think at least. Um, the uh, well, what what you can say also is that this um, I mentioned the the AI has been prevalent in in healthcare for a long time. So there's from from the AI technology perspective, even though it's been a lot of development in the technology there as well, there's no reason why the patient directed AI should come this late when doctors have been using it for a long time. Uh, I think the greatest reason why we're seeing a, a, a move towards patient-directed uh, artificial intelligence is the uh, increased availability of uh, interfaces that are convenient and intuitive enough for patients to use. Uh, patients are... Well, track back to the, the use of doctors, of AI, they are in a position wh where you can allow a doctor to spend an hour training to get to use with the AI system, uh, and, and that works well. But uh, a patient, you can't expect the patient to spend an hour in training to use this kind of system. This has to be intuitive. It doesn't has to not require uh, any training. And, well, you could say that uh, the, the, the most obvious choice in that, and wi what we also see is driving this change, is, is the use of conversational interfaces. Messaging as a as a tool is is the most uh, prevalent form of communication in the world, even more so in certain studies than face-to-face uh, -face communication. Uh, so this is this is a, a mode of communication that almost every people is uh, is aware of and and can use. Uh, onto a computer, you are dependent upon some technologies for this interface to to work. And these are uh, these are part of the AI technologies, uh, NLP and NLG, which stands for uh, natural language processing and natural language generation, which are the the, the tools that use the processing part, is is uh, how the computer makes sense of human natural language, and transforms it in transforms it into constructed uh, computer language uh, that you can, if you so like, can put into a spreadsheet or do whatever you want with. On the other hand, uh, NLG is the opposite that allows a human to express structured data in a human natural form. Uh, and this uh, development is, is uh, quite new, uh, especially in Scandinavian languages. These have only existed uh, quality systems for in the last year or so. Uh, now, of course, if any of you have any uh, knowledge or have any experience with these kind of interfaces and chatbots that 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 use these kind of interfaces, you would probably think that this is uh, a hype, and and it is a hype. There is an obvious overusage of the conversational interface for uh, tools that don't really need that and don't really uh, employ manage to employ it in a good way, uh, which which gives the user a rather worse experience again because you have the experience of not getting understanding of what you're saying. But I think that's more of a question of maturity of the technology than the potential in it, really. Uh, the, the, the greatest limitation, uh, I think, uh, for this in a clinical setting is, is not the technology, therefore, but rather the limitation of uh, verbal communication in itself. Uh, because there is so much clinical information that you don't get in words that is uh, equally, as important, equally as important or more important than uh, than the communication that you can have verbally with a with a patient. I could say w by an example from a clinical setting, uh, if you have had any experiences with being 
uh, admitted to a hospital at any point for, uh, for treatment, uh, you may have been uh, annoyed by the fact that you will be asked to present your complaints again and again and again by different doctors during, during the course. Some of this may, of course, be because of um, information logistical challenges, but there's also an aspect of it which concerns uh, the information that the doctor is, uh, is trying to get. Uh, if I'm asked to consult a patient with a stomach pain, for instance, I would like to see that patient myself. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, that, um, well, patients don't have... I'm very interested in the characteristics of the pain of the stomach, the very specific characteristics. And patients don't have an extensive vocabulary for uh, describing pain, obviously. Th there's, should, there's no reason why they should have that in their nor normal life. Uh, so what they use instead is their body language. Uh, they use their arms and, and their hands and, and, and all their body to show where it stabs and squeezes and moves and grimacing and all of these things uh, have enormous amount of information in it, uh, which, which, um, which is also a recognized very important part of, of being a good uh, physician and also something I think doctors generally take a, a certain pride in. If, if you if you, uh, you, you could easily hear the conversation or hear an, uh, an exchange in, a, in an emergency room where a doctor would say to another doctor, if you can see that patient over there, the girl with the, like, the drawn-up knees and the flushed cheeks, she's got an appendicitis. I'm just calling it. This is, uh, uh, this is very common and I think I'm guilty of it myself. But, but, uh, but the point is that there is, a, in the layer of communication that where information you can get, there is a lot in the layer that is nonverbal. And, and I think that is rather the limitation of the conversational interface. Um, and the challenge of how to uh, transform that or how, to, uh, how do you get that information as well uh, when you are moving, when you're trying to get that information through a conversational interface. Uh, you can't get the body language through uh, through a digital uh, screen, I think. Uh, but you have, on the other hand, a lot of uh, possibilities in terms of, of interaction modalities that you don't have face-to-face. -face. So more than it's limited, it's I think it's more different. You can get a lot of information, but differently. And I think the most important uh, thing with this is the approach you do, or the approach you have to how you get this information. I think. Uh, it's important that you ask yourself uh, by any by any piece of information that you're trying to get if if the way you're trying to get that information is the best way or if it's possible to get that information in any other way. Uh, and 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 there's a lot of tools that can be employed here. Uh, if 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 the patient. I mean, one thing is to use the patient's own language. That's the obvious thing. If, if a patient uh, describes their depression as darkness, then you can uh, use that allegory and, and ask, if you're trying to assess the level of depression, instead of asking uh, what, please state the level of your depression, you could rather ask them how dark is your depression uh, and all these kinds of things. Uh, this is just an example of how, how uh, instead of uh, simply asking a patient to, um, to describe how their eye looks, if, it, if the patient has complied about a red eye, it give them options, illustration to select, uh, and all these kinds of things. Uh, even so, though, uh, you, you, you can have a lot of good questions if you do this work. But if you're making a system to, to understand a problem uh, automatically, you will be having, say, thousands, tens of thousands of questions in, in, a, in a question bank. And uh, being approached by a patient, uh, being approached by a patient with a problem, and you have these questions, uh, the obvious or naive approach to getting the best information is to ask all the questions. But of course, this is not possible. Uh, this is not possible. There are uh, constraints uh, in 
this uh, form, you have the constraint primarily in in the uh, in the fatigue or attention span of the user, uh, but but it's essentially still the same problem or the same uh, problem you're trying to solve that doctors have been working with for hundreds of years. The constraints are different. For doctors, it's been primarily a time limitation uh, for the consultation, but you're still faced with the same problem that you have thousands of potential questions, you have a patient with a problem, and you have the, you have the task to selecting the 10 or 20 most relevant questions to get the best picture of that pa patient's problem. So building these kinds of systems, I think the first thing you should consult or the first books you should get is, is uh, uh, basically Bates' Guide to History Taking and Physical Examination. I mean, there is literature on this, which, which, which is very powerful even uh, in this kind of usage. Well, nonetheless, though, uh, back to the questions. Uh, there is... Uh, taking the situation where you have all these questions, uh, there has to be some sort of a relationship between them. Uh, f for, uh, for this kind of system to work, you have to have some sort of association between questions, which makes it logical uh, which question follows another, uh, and etc. And this is where you have to make uh, choices in terms of what kind of technology you're using and how you're configuring uh, the artificial technology that you're using. Uh, I'm going to take the short introduction to... Um, or this is a very simplified model, though, but this is the two most relevant or extreme sides of, of the, the models that you can have in terms of the relationship between uh, questions. On the one hand, you have the decision trees, which are very static relations. I, I represent the questions by bullet points here, uh, though. The decision trees are very static. You have from a cuff point, you could say that you answer yes, and then you get the sputum if you have a question, if you have like a productive cough or slime in your cuff. So this, in, in this model, this is the, the relationship between the cuff and the, and the sputum question. Uh, on the other hand, you have the statistical models where the different concepts are related uh, statistically. So you could say, uh, in this example, Cough is related to chest pain uh, by a factor of 0 0.54, while chest pain is related to cough with a smaller uh, association, 0 0.24. This is just uh, made up examples, but, but these are the principles. Uh, uh, the reason why, why these two uh, models are, are central is because the decision tree is an example of a model that has a very high explainability but low accuracy. It's very easy, or it's very important if you're making this kind of system, uh, that it is explainable. If, if you build a system that, uh, that receives information, processes information, and comes up with a conclusion, uh, say that that conclusion is what kind of drug that you should have or what kind of treatment you should have, it's important that it is an explainability in it that the doctor can go into it and see why does the computer come up with this uh, decision. And with the decision tree, this is very easy. You simply follow the, the path of the decisions and, and you, you can see the entire explanation there. Statistical models, on the other hand, uh, are high in accuracy but low explainability. And, and the reason why they're low explainability is because if you ask why you come up with this decision, you only get a number. Uh, and that's uh, uh, rather not uh, enough to, to uh, uh, at least convince a lot of doctors to use this kind of system, I think. So, on the other hand, though, the statistical models have a much higher accuracy because they you, you can train these. Uh, they, uh, th their association are numerical, uh, linked, uh, so you could put them through machine learning algorithms uh, and the machine can say that uh, in this situation I associate this concept with this concept, and you can say no, that's wrong, uh, and then they co and then the system can correct itself, try to adjust some of the values, and try again. And in this way, you can get a more precise and trained system, which makes it uh, gives it a higher accuracy. Decision trees, on the other hand, are more, more much more static and have the lowest accuracy in in in, in these kind of models. So what you want to have, of course, in this kind of system 
is the best of both. You want a system that has high explainability, but also a high accuracy. Um, and I, I can show a bit later how we have tried to implement this. Uh, another thing concerning questions, or the relationship between questions uh, first. Uh, in this example, or this illustration, you can see I've re represented symptoms here as red dots. Uh, so in, in one of the examples, you have only a patient that uh, admits only one symptom or complains of one symptom. And the other example, you have a patient that complains of three symptoms. Now, given the fact that you have constraints, uh, you have a limitation to how many questions you can uh, spend uh, on this patient before they lose their, uh, their attention. You have to uh, distribute these questions uh, in a certain way. You can't spend as much energy uh, when you have three different symptoms that you need to map th as you can with if you only have one question. And this speaks to the fact that you need uh, another layer or another structure than uh, the um, the simple relationship between uh, the questions themselves, because the relationship between questions in the in these examples are the same. Uh, there's another control layer uh, in, the in in play here, uh, and that's in this session I uh, or in this instance I, I, I'm calling it a, an interview reasoning layer. You need some sort of element that not only concerns itself with questions, but also with uh, the entire interview as a whole. Uh, and this reasoning layer has uh, a lot of jobs to do uh, in order for this to be a well-functioning system. The first thing, as, as I mentioned, is to be able to adapt the length or time of the, of the questioning by the effort or time. In addition, you have to balance the composition of interview as a whole. Uh, if you... If you take uh, uh, if you if you start from 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 the experience of of uh, interviews as they're done in a clinical setting and as doctors are trained to do them uh, there are phases of an interview you start maybe with the uh, open questions orienting questions uh, and as you get an idea of where the problem is or what is could be the problem you uh, narrow down the 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 questions into this and focus the questions on on, uh, on symptoms, for instance. In addition, you maybe have uh, like associative questions, the kind of questions that a doctor would ask without really knowing why he or she asks them, but just because something rings a bell, just to catch the outliers of, of diseases or, or symptoms. So you have to have a system that can balance all these things, that can say that y we need to have this kind of orientation, then we try to focus, and we can afford to spend so many, uh, so much energy on patients we have just trying to catch potential outliers. Uh, another thing is the grouping of questions by the strong association, packages, so to speak. If, if something triggers a cancer suspicion, for instance, you'd, you'd like to know a very specific set of, of questions. You'd like to know the... Uh, uh, like the night sweats, uh, weight loss, etc., and these you want to ask together. So there's a strong association between some questions. Additionally, there's a question that you can group. Yep. Uh, so <laughs> this is uh, very fast. Uh, I'm going to say also that you can. Uh, it's important to counter the second guessing of the algorithm because if you use an AI to ask, everything reflects back to you. So if you start asking cancer questions, you run the risk that the patient starts thinking. Uh, does this mean the computer think I have cancer? And this is also an ethical question. How far can you go in an unsupervised questioning? Uh, this is the pool model I was talking about. The essence here is that you encapsulate uh, chains of questions in a construct that, uh, that uh, affect each other. So the questions affect these probes. I could talk more about any of you if you are interested afterwards. Summary, focus on understanding problems and communicate through the patient's language. Keep the patient informed and strive for both explainability and accuracy. I'm going to cut it short there. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Here, I've given a little oh. gift for you. <laughs> okay, I think we need a break, so I'm sorry I had to just be a little bit strong on time. Uh, there will be telemedicine here in the next uh, session. There will be genetics at another room. There will be still a lot of more interesting content. So take a break, break go around, take a cup of coffee or a glass of water, and... Enjoy the conference. Thank you. <laughs>